can you answer the question that I will, when I achieve this goal, I will be, fill in the blank, I will do, fill in the blank, and I will feel, fill in the blank. And if you can answer all of those, um, the goal becomes meaningless. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now... Let's get invested. Welcome, Freedom Fighters. How many of you press the snooze button when the alarm rings in the morning? And how many of you press it more than once? I'm sure all of us have had times when we we want to get up early, but we just fail to do so. And let me ask you another question. How often have you been determined to start eating less unhealthy food and takeaways? And how often... Have you succeeded in doing it for any more than a few weeks or maybe a couple of months? We all want to live healthier lives, but many of us fail to do so. We've got great intentions, but day-to-day temptations just keep getting in the way. So we want to get up early and we want to live healthier lives, but somehow we don't. And what about your retirement? Are you saving and investing enough now to live comfortably when you stop work? Or do you plan to look into this in the future because you've got no time now and you feel like you've got plenty of time to think about it? Chances are that later, maybe much later, and then it may even be too late. Imagine if you don't save and invest enough. Your lifestyle is likely to drop off the cliff and you'll be forced to keep working until you drop. You may be forced to sell your home to move into a smaller property. You may have to cut back on things that are of interest, and give up your interests exactly at the time that you've got more time to enjoy them. And if you're like the current average retiree over the age of 65, you'll struggle to make ends meet. Why is all this? From getting out of bed to eating better to living more comfortably long term, it's obvious that there's a gap that we all suffer from. The gap between what we plan to do and what we actually do. We plan to do one thing and end up doing something else. We plan to look into savings and investment in the near future, but we keep procrastinating and we never quite get around to it. Why do we have this gap, and wouldn't it be great if we could close it? Well, you might think that closing the gap's not difficult. We simply have to care more about the future, don't we? Well, as we all know, it's not quite that simple. We do care about the future. We have ambitious plans for the future. We just fail to carry them out. So today I want to return to the question that keeps plaguing me and frustrating me. Why don't more of us plan long term and take action now that will significantly improve our lives in the future? How do we shift our thinking from short term to long term? How do we develop the patience and the persistence to make decisions and take actions now that focus on our future self, not our present self, to shift from the immediate to the infinite. I'm very fearful for a lot of hardworking professionals and families who are not investing in their future lifestyles, whether it be in self-development, health development, or wealth development, because we need all three if we're going to sustain a long and fruitful lifestyle. I'm on a mission to wake up as many people as possible 
to take the small amount of time it takes now to invest in themselves so they have a much healthier and wealthier lifestyle in the future. Because it just isn't that hard. We just need to do what we know we need to do, but we just don't make the time to do it. In my constant search for answers, my research has uncovered a number of other reasons for all this. And the first is that our instant everything world has become totally dominated by short-termism. At its simplest, short-termism is being locked into a cycle where the here and now totally eclipses our ability to think or plan for the long term. This is now endemic in our always-on digital-first culture that we're currently living in, where it feels like digital technology has pushed the fast-forward button on society generally, and it prestiges and elevates things that are now, next, fast and instant over everything else. And the flip side of this is that later, slow and the future is denigrated and has been perceived as having no value. We can pick up our phones now and spend hundreds of dollars instantly or check the likes in our social media posts. And every time we do it, we get that little dopamine hit and that feeling of, oh, that was nice, I feel better now because I was feeling a bit crappy before and now I'm feeling good again. This is a growing problem because what we're doing is getting short-term satisfaction but not thinking long-term, which starts to affect our relationships, our finances, and permeates every aspect of our entire lifestyles. The behavioural scientist Ivo Vlaev defines short-termism in psychology as our tendency to overvalue immediate rewards and undervalue long-term intentions. We tend to focus on our immediate financial needs and we forget our long-term plans. Retirement, for example, just looks so far ahead in the future, so we tend to discount it, ignore it, and put it off prevent ourselves from doing anything about investing in the future for a later date, a date that rarely, if ever, happens. Today, a click really is instant. Not like our parents' version of instant, where you'd have to send away for something or you had to make it yourself, or you'd go out to a shop, as everything we need is right here, right now. Everything has become very compressed. Now, don't get me wrong. Digital culture has brought us incredible things. The ability to see all things at all times and we've become kind of omnipresent. But the flip side of this is that we're never really present in the moment. The second ironic thing, according to Kirsten Road, is that the first step towards closing the gap between what we plan to do and what we actually do is to become aware that we can't escape from it. And to better understand the gap... Road suggests that it helps to think of ourselves in the future as a different person to the one that we are today. Not only will our circumstances change, but our preferences change over time as well, from day to day, from minute to minute. It's as if we are a different self at every point in time. We see our current self as planning, while our future self is doing. The gap between planning and doing is essentially the result of a disagreement between our current self and and our future self. So the self who sets the alarm and wants to get up early, and the self who wakes up from the alarm and wants to stay in that nice, warm, comfortable bed have different ideas. And Roe believes there are at least three reasons for a disagreement between our current and our future selves. First of all, circumstances change. So imagine that in the near future, there'll be a great technological breakthrough that will enable us to live 10 years longer. Well... Then my future self will decide to save more for retirement than my current self plans to do. This disagreement between my current and my future self is caused by this unexpected change in circumstances. So none of these selves is to blame for making a wrong decision. They simply have different information on which to base their decisions. But when I set the alarm in the evening and I wake up next morning, circumstances haven't changed that much. It's me, my preferences that have changed. I simply want to stay in bed. So changing circumstances are only part of the story. Our preferences change as well. Why? Well, most of the plans we make have consequences for several of our future selves. So when we make plans, 
we have to trade off the well-being of different future selves. So we have to determine how important we find one self relative to the others. We have to determine how much priority we give to our different selves. How do we do this? Well, in general, we care less about the future than about the present. So the future, so the further in the future a self gets, the less priority it gets. But what causes the gap between planning and doing is the fact that the priorities that we give to these different selves may change over time. The closer we get to our future selves, the larger the priority we give to the sooner relative to the later selves. But how does this apply to my alarm alarm clock? Well, when I set the alarm in the evening, I have to trade off the well-being of at least two of my future selves. The self who wakes up from the alarm and wants to stay in bed, and the self, the later self, who doesn't want to miss exercising before I start work. When I set the alarm, I may decide to give equal priority to both of these selves. I may decide that the discomfort of getting out of bed early is less painful than the discomfort of not exercising. So I'll decide to set the alarm relatively early. But once the alarm rings in the morning, I'll give more priority to the self who wakes up and I'll decide to stay in bed. So it's as if myself who wakes up puts too much priority on myself. In that sense, we could say that the self who wakes up is responsible for the gap between planning and doing. But maybe the self who sets the alarm fails to correctly anticipate how much discomfort I'll feel when waking up from the alarm. So maybe it's the self who sets the alarm that makes a mistake. Maybe it's that self that's responsible for the gap between planning and doing. And this brings road to a third reason for a disagreement between our current and our future selves. When we make decisions with future consequences, we have to project ourselves to the future. We have to imagine how much our future selves will like what our current self decides today. And research has shown that this is really difficult for us to do this. We tend to overestimate how similar our future selves are to our current selves. It's called projection bias. It's as if we don't have sufficient empathy for our future selves. So imagine you're buying the weekly groceries. When you go to the supermarket, you buy food that will be consumed by your future self. So what you buy should depend on what you think your future self would like to eat, and it shouldn't depend on your current appetite. But if you've ever bought groceries on an empty stomach, you know what happens. We tend to buy more unhealthy food on an empty stomach than a full stomach. When we prefer a muffin to an apple right now, we tend to think that we'll also prefer the muffin to the apple in the future. But in the future, we may actually prefer the apple, a disagreement between our current and our future selves. Here we can say that the current self fails to correctly foresee what the future self will need. So here we could say that the current self is responsible for the gap between planning and doing. In summary, Rhodes sees three reasons why we make plans that we fail to stick to. Circumstances may change. The priorities we give to our different selves may change. And it's really hard for us to guess what our future selves will need and like. Now, we can't say that the gap between planning and doing shows that we fail to do the right things. No. Maybe we just fail, fail to make the right plans. So it's not clear which self is to blame for the gap between planning and doing. Us as the planner or the doer. But how can we close the gap? By deciding to commit ourselves to our plans as long as we're taking the time to make them. So when I set the alarm, I could decide to put it across the other side of the room so that the only way to press the snooze button is to get out of bed. And if I use this strategy of commitment, then essentially I'm shifting some decision power from my future to my current self because then my future self has to adjust to whatever my current self decides to to do today. And of course, this strategy only works if I'm aware of the possible disagreement between my current and my future selves. So the gap between planning and doing is the result of an ongoing struggle between our different selves, and it's not clear which self is actually right. But if we're aware of the gap, then we can commit ourselves to our plans. All in all, Awareness is the first step towards closing the gap. 
it will make us suffer less from the tension between what we want today and what we want tomorrow. So one of the secrets to doing what we plan to do is to find commitment devices that help us to stick to healthier and wealthier lifestyles. But there's much more to it than that. As I discovered when I came across cognitive psychologist Amanda Crowell's work, that builds on the work we discussed in episode 125 with the insecurity guy, Jamin Fraser. So go back and have a listen to this, because it was an absolute cracker conversation, and I've personally been doing some work with Jamin ever since. Now, Amanda offers three additional reasons we aren't doing what we say we'll do. To illustrate her points, let me start with a personal story. When I was growing up in late primary and early high school, I rarely exercised. I was a chronic asthmatic that left me bedridden and physically undeveloped. I just didn't have the breathing ability to do any active hobbies. I really struggled to play any sports. The few times I tried to play footy, I'd get belted and left for dead. I was slow and weak and left huffing and puffing after the smallest of runs. Now this went on for a number of years and I was constantly being made fun of and ostracised for being a little punk-chested run. I knew something needed to change. Now the only option to get fitter and stronger is to exercise. But it just wasn't who I was at the time. I just didn't believe I was capable of any strenuous exercise because I couldn't breathe and it scared the hell out of me. And I'm sure we've all had something like this, haven't we? Something that we we know if we're going to become the person we want to be, this thing has to change. But even though we think about it all the time, we never make any progress. This phenomenon is what Amanda Crowell calls defensive failure. And it goes something like this. Let's say it's a Sunday night and you say to your partner, this week I'm going to the gym at least three times. Then, in a flash, Friday comes around and you haven't been to the gym at all. It's really mysterious, right? You're like, well, I meant to go to the gym. I intended to go to the gym. Well, I'm I'm not going to the gym. Well, Crowell's research on this has uncovered that much of the reason you're not doing what you say you want to do is in your mind, the identity stories that you've convinced yourself of. Cromwell found that there are three powerful mindset blocks that are keeping you locked in a cycle of defensive failure. And if any of these is actually in play, your brain defends you against real failure, which is where you do something but you do it really badly. By directing you and distracting you, and you never make any progress. So let's talk about each one. The first reason that you may be locked in a cycle of defensive failure is that you think somewhere in your heart that you can't do it. You think that some people have the talent or the genetics to do this, and specifically, that you don't. Let's return to my early experience with exercise. I was determined to do something about my punk-chested runt demeanour, So my good mother decided to get me into swimming lessons to build up my chest, my breathing and my general fitness. At first, I was absolutely petrified and scared of the water. As an asthmatic who really struggled to breathe at the best of times, the mere thought of trying to hold my breath underwater scared the living crap out of me. I'll never forget, I rocked up to the pool in my baggy oversized togs, which is what we called them at the time, And after I refused to get in the water in front of all the other school kids, the swimming instructor just picked me up and threw me into the middle of the pool. I really thought I was going to drown. Thrashing helplessly in the water and swallowing mouthfuls of chlorine, I somehow managed to drag myself kicking and gasping to the edge of the pool. And after hanging on to dear life as I slowly regained my breath, as I dragged myself up out of the pool, my swimmers fell down around my ankles. And everyone burst out laughing. I was embarrassed beyond belief. This was my worst living nightmare. And this, in my mind, was exactly the kind of failure I desperately wanted to avoid. I tried to do something for the first time, and I did it wrong. Right? Well, Cromwell suggests that what happens in this moment is at the heart of this mindset block. If you believe that at the core of success is talent and genetics, then this rookie mistake matters a lot. 
It's the proof that you needed that you didn't have what it takes, right? But if you can instead develop what Carol Dweck would refer to as a growth mindset about it, then this beginner mistake starts to lose its significance. They're no longer proof that you have never should have tried. They're actually opportunities to learn. Because you know that at the heart of success, it's not talent, it's effort. It's effort repeated over time that produces accomplishment. It's effort that creates innovation. And if you're able to shift your mindset from this belief that some people have it and you don't, and into one where you recognise that your rookie mistakes are just signposts on the pathway to success, then you'll be able to walk away from this cycle of defensive failure. Now, that's the first reason you've locked in to this cycle of defensive failure. The second reason that Crowell suggests that you may be locked in this cycle of defensive failure is that you think that people like you don't do things like this. And this one comes down to your identity. And most of us care a lot about our identities, don't we? And part of the reason you care so much about your identity is because it's been so hard fought and so hard won. So let's talk about how you form your identity, which generally solidifies in our adolescence. Now, you had an identity before adolescence, but basically you just absorbed it from those people closest around you. Like mum would say, you're autistic, or dad would say, you're very studious. Yeah, okay, that sounded right, and you started believing the story. But that switches in adolescence, because you begin to start really asking yourself hard questions about who you are, and you do this socially with your friends and those around you. And you start asking yourself, am I like this person? Am I like that person? Am I like you? And you take on a little piece of their identity and you see how it feels. For me, it was like trying very badly to be like the cool kids and smoking behind the shelter shed and shutting my bedroom door and playing Kiss as loudly and repeatedly as I can, if you can remember the band Kiss. You tend to take on bits and pieces of the people around you and in so doing, you do what Eric Erickson refers to as identity fracturing. It's really uncomfortable. It creates a lot of friction in your mind because you don't know who you really are. But the good news is that eventually, sometime in your late high school years, you begin to release the pieces of your identity that just aren't serving you. Maybe you stop hanging out with the cool kid smokers. Maybe you decide... Footy's just not my thing and you start hanging out and you stop hanging out with a footy crew and, and take up another sport. In my case, it was field hockey because it was better suited to my diminutive size at the time. Each piece of that identity that you let go comes at a loss to you though. Those friends you were hanging out with, they have mat- may have mattered a lot to you, you and you feel a bit like a traitor. The footy team that you stopped hanging out with that might lose credibility and popularity for you at school. And this process of what Eric Erickson refers to as identity cohesion is very difficult. But it does result in an identity, a belief about who you think you really are. The subconscious stories that you start believing about yourself that Jamin Fraser talked about on that previous episode. And that matters to you to a lot. And you won't do anything that threatens that identity once it's been set in place. Now, I can hear you saying, well, this is all really interesting, Bushy, but what the hell has this got to do with following through on my future goals? Well, let me give you another example. When I first became a finance broker, I struggled to get clients because I considered myself to be a professional guide and an advisor, not a salesman. And promoting myself and selling my services felt really salesy, fake and pushy. I just didn't see myself that way. Would I do something that feels salesy, fake and pushy? Hell no, not in your nearly, never. And that's how you get locked into a cycle of defensive failure. You say, I'm going to go to a networking event. In fact, I'm going to go to one every week for this whole month. Then the day comes for the networking event and your brain's like, yeah, nah, we're not going to do that. That threatens our identity. And anyway, Bushy, you're too tired. You've been so busy. You should 
take some time out. And before you know it, the networking event is happening somewhere, but you're nowhere to be seen. You're at home on the couch in your tracky ducks and your rug boots, binging on Netflix. And I'm sure some of you have been there. But it does explain why you're not making any progress. So if this sounds like you, this might be a mindset block that you're struggling with. What Amanda Crow suggests you do is to find people like you doing things like this and then share your concerns with them and learn from them. For me, I had to find another down-to-earth genuine finance broker who was great at promoting their business and then learn from them on how I could bring these things into line. And if you can find a way to bring what you do in line with your identity, you'll find going to the networking event much, much easier. For me, it was just about creating new relationships, not about sales. And that's the second reason you're locked in a cycle of defensive failure. The third reason that you're locked into a cycle of defensive failure is that secretly you just don't want to do it. You just think you should do something. And if you catch yourself using the word should instead of want, then this is a big red flag. Basically, you value it for the wrong reasons. Now, Crowell suggests that there are two ways that you can value things. On the one hand, you can value them for what we refer to as internal intrinsic reasons, reasons that come from inside of you, interest, curiosity, or you've drawn a straight bright line from the one thing you want to do up to your long-term hopes and dreams. But you can also value things for reasons that are outside of you, extrinsic reasons like all the cool people do it, or my mum would be proud, or boy, I'd really like to be admired. Now, let's just say for a second, for the sake of the example, that you've said, I've really got to stick to a budget. And you know, the thing I do the most that's really wasting money is that I buy my lunch every single day at work. So you decide, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to start making and taking my lunch. So one day, you're halfway through your commute to work and you realise that your lunch is still sitting on the kitchen bench. Now, for me, that's a really hard day. You've got nothing to eat and good food is one of my biggest vices. What are you going to do? So you're talking to your workmate like, oh, I'm really having a hard day. And he says, don't even worry about it. We'll take it as a sign from the universe. We'll go out and have a real lunch. Let's go to the pub and enjoy a schnitty. So you're then confronted with two options. You can go with your friend and have a real lunch, spend 30, 40 bucks on a can of meal and some drinks, or you can go to the vending machine and get a measly $2 power bar. What are you going to do? Well, it depends on why you're sticking to the budget. If you're trying to stick to a budget because you've got engaged and you're trying to buy a house and you've got dreams of your children sitting next to you enjoying Christmas Eve, then you'll go to the vending machine. But if you're trying to save money because wealthy people are admired, and yeah, it could be cool to be admired, then the reason isn't going to be enough. It's not enough to counterbalance the urge the desire in the moment to go to a restaurant with your friend. And this works for anything that you're struggling with. If the work you want to do is hard, there'll be urges in the moment to quit. And it's this intrinsic interest that keeps you focused on the steps you need to take and not those urges of the moment to go with your friend at the restaurant. So if this sounds like you, if this sounds like something you might be struggling with, You have to build out your intrinsic interest from within. You have to find a way to be interested or curious about what it is that you want to do. You have to do the reading and you have to invest in improving your knowledge and your interest. And if you can't, if there's nothing of interest to you, for example, learning about taxes, then you have to draw the bright line between the thing you want to do and your long-term hopes and dreams. When the moment comes that you want to get out, give up, you take that piece of paper out of your pocket and you read it to yourself so that you ground yourself back in your intrinsic interest and the payoff that you're going to get. And that is how Crowell suggests that you would break out of the third cycle of defensive failure. And she believes that if you even have one of these in place, you'll struggle to make progress on any of your goals. If you've struggled with something your whole life, it's likely that all three are at play 
like it was for me with my early swimming exercise. But as I was able to accept those rookie mistakes as part of the process of getting better, like a toddler learning to walk who keeps falling over but just relentlessly keeps getting up, and you recognise that there are undeveloped asthmatic people like me who also exercise and eventually, after years of swimming three nights a week and carving out kilometres in the pool, I started to see significant physical results and I got really interested in the science of exercise. I was able, amazingly, to begin to make some really good progress. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's as easy as just saying, get your mindsets in order and you'll be a raging overnight success, because that's clearly not how it works. But what you do get to do is to trade that cycle of defensive failure for action-driven, insight filled productive failure. Failure where you do, you do it wrong, but then you get a little better. You learn from it. And then you do it better over time until suddenly you're doing what you never thought was possible. For me, what that looked like was over the course of about three years because I taught myself to swim freestyle, I taught myself breaststroke, I taught myself how to participate in the relay races and one school sports day I strung all those three together and I won all three races. And I was the most surprised because the bedridden, punk-chested asthmatic of old would never have believed that that was even possible. And I'm not mentioning this because I'm any kind of athlete, because clearly that's not the case. I'm mentioning this because that school sports day swimming carnival was the most exciting day of my life at the time. Because it should never have been my story. It should, in my mind, never have been possible. And what it helped me to realise that day was that I, that you, that all of us, can be and can do anything we want. If we get our head clear, we change our internal story and we begin begin to take steps. And if you're doing those things, nothing can stop you. Now, if you want some help in changing your internal story, then reach out to Jamin Fraser at jaminfraser.com. That's J-A-E-M-I-N, Fraser with a Z, F-R-A-Z-E-R.com. And if you're concerned about changing your financial future by learning more about who you are, what you value, and what is best suited to help you live the life you want with the money you have, then today's guest Vince Scully is here to help you in part two of our deeply engaging and informative discussion. If you listened to the last episode, you'll know that Vince is a veteran financial advisor, an author, and financial wellness advocate, and the founder of Life Sherpa an online platform that helps you make money in investing accessible and affordable. He's realised that what makes you comfortable with your money and allows you to live the life you want with the money you have isn't about how much you earn or save or where you invest it. What makes a difference is truly understanding what you want and spending your money in a way that gets you closer to achieving it. It's about you getting clear on your true life goals and values, what I call living by design in my book, The Freedom Formula. And Vince's book, The Latte Fallacy and Other Money Myths, helps you with all of this. The book book provides you with simple practical tools to get the most out of the money you have. It helps you develop an understanding of what really matters to you and gives you an easy-to-follow eight-step plan to help you achieve it. It gives you the skills to live a fulfilling life free of money stress, no matter how much or how little you have. And if you'd like to win an ebook copy of Vince's book, just email me at bushy at knowhowproperty.com.au with the word get invested in the subject header. And then tell us the one luxury that you refuse to give up, and Vince will award a free book to the best entry. Runners up will also receive a free ebook copy of my award winning book, Get Invested. Now, in this fact packed conclusion to my conversation with Vince today, we cover. What is your money personality and why is this important? What are the big six money decisions that you need to make that will have the most impact on your financial future? How can you utilise the unique Pearl spending tool to improve your money management? 
What are the four key things to look at when it comes to investing? What are the three best things to do with your surplus cash? And what are the three categories of debt and which ones do you need to focus on? So if you want to learn more about how to live the life you want with the money you have, sit back and enjoy more of this really informative chat with Vince Scully because we're going to go straight into a discussion on the big six money decisions that you need to make. Enjoy. You talk about, um, you know, that making the decisions around the latte versus the, the big six decisions, they're going to have a yep. massive impact. Can you uh, sort of you, uh, talk You're going to ask me what, what the six are? are? Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the big six um, are where you live, what you drive, how you prepare for the unexpected, how you plan for retirement, how you make a living, and who you marry. And just coming back to those, so so where you live is obviously about buying the right amount of house. But it also drives like we become a lot like our neighbours. So people in suburbs, you know, we shop in the same shops, our kids go to the same schools, we go to the same places on holidays, we drive the same cars. Um, so uh, so much of your living costs are driven by the house that you bought and where it is. Yep. The second one is the car, um, and those two together amount to about 40% of most life t- most people's lifetime spending. Yeah. And the trick with the car is not whether you take out a car loan or not. It's how much car you buy and how long you keep it for because depreciation is you know, 80% of the cost. Yeah. Um, then, so those two together are about 40% of your lifetime spending. And the third one then is how you prepare for the unexpected. So life never works out the way we plan. Yeah. Our cars break down, our kids get sick, um, we lose our jobs, COVID happens. Um, and so how you prepare for that, which is yeah, having an emergency stash, um, having some buffers in your, like not borrowing to the hilt, um, and insurance. Yeah. So everybody who depends on an income to pay the bills needs income protection insurance. Yeah. How much, with whom, for how long, they're all, you know, at the edges. You still need yeah. it. Yep. Um, and similarly, you know, TPD, uh, total and permanent disability, which is really long-term income protection. Yep. Um, life and trauma. All of those, and then all those other things like car insurance, house insurance. And the rule is, yeah, if you can't afford to take the risk, you should insure it. If you can afford to take the risk, don't bother. Yeah. And so working out what those risks are is important. Yeah. And preparing for retirement. You know, the biggest challenge we face is how to make 40 years of income support a life of 80 years. Or more. Or yep. more. Yeah. Whatever it is. Um, and we all well, – almost all of us start our adult life with limited or negative financial assets but an ab- abundance of human capital which is largely our ability to earn a living. And over the next period, we have to turn enough of that human capital into financial capital to pay for the bit of life that happens after we're unable or unwilling to work. And now, when are you unable or unwilling to work? Well, there's a huge amount of people say, well, actually, I'd really like to retire at 30 or 35. Um, Well, the context of the content, the Consequence of that is you have to spend less than you earn by a bigger margin in those first 15 years. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a mathematical relationship. Mm. The biggest, the big question is working out um, what how then? much is enough. Yes. What then? And am I getting something that's worth toasting a million dollar asset? So if, if I'm 40 and I'm making, I don't know, 100 grand a year, 
my that income stream out to age 65 is worth millions of dollars. Yeah. So if you're going to retire today, you're effectively setting fire to $2 million. And if you're not getting something that's worth more to you, then you really shouldn't be doing this. That's a really good comment. Lots, lo- I mean, lots yeah. of people do get more for it. Yeah. Um, you know, some people, I- I've helped you know, a lot of people get there and um, – but you've really got to understand and firmly believe that what you're getting, well, sorry, understand the trade-off you're making, first of all, and most people don't see that $2 million pile of money being toasted um, and understand that what you're getting is worth that spend. Mm-hmm. It is for a lot of people. I mean, I've seen some extremely happy people you know, spend 10 years in software or the law or banking and you know, retire to a farm and live relatively frugal lives, but you know, as happy as I've ever seen them. Yeah. So I'm not against the idea of financial independence retire early. Um, you know, everyone has to achieve financial independence. All we're arguing about is when. Yeah. And um, if you are going to retire, just make sure what you're getting is better than what you had. And if you're doing this because you don't like your boss, then that's a really expensive solution to a relatively small problem. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, a couple of other so, things. You, um, you, so that's so yeah. that's so that's um, we've that's four. Four, yeah. Um, and then number five is how you make a living, um, which is really around: you know, Are you going to be an employee? What What are you doing about improving your skills and your worth? So if you're a street sweeper, you know, be the best street sweep, sweeper you can possibly be yeah. and reward will follow yeah. um, and invest in yourself to improve your skills and the value of that human capital. And, you know, the choice to become self-employed, it's the thing of financial advice blogs. You know, everyone's saying that the only way you can get rich is to become self-employed. Um, the only way to true freedom is to become self-employed. Well, the truth is that 60% of self-employed people earn less than 50 grand. 85% of them earn less than 100. And 90% of the population is psychologically unsuited to it. And, and because, because we don't deal with uncertainty very well. And two out of and three of them go broke trying to become self-employed yeah. because they jump off the so, chasm and two years later they're, <laughs> they're on the bones. Um, <laughs> but there's no doubt that you know, some people do get immensely wealthy by creating businesses. And... That's a good thing. But to suggest, as Robert Kiyosaki does, that J-O-B stands for just over broke and for so long as you're doing a job, you'll never be wealthy is just nonsense. And it's used by every huckster in town to sell multi-level marketing plans, get-rich-quick schemes and in most cases, it ends badly. Yeah. yeah. And then finally, you know, who you marry. And that's a bit flippant. But what I actually mean by that is that the – obviously, living as a couple is cheaper than living as two singles. So there's a economic benefit in coupling. Yeah. But the couples who succeed most are those who are aligned on values and – operate as a single financial system. Now, you know what I say, system, not single bank account, that I don't necessarily buy the argument that you have to go all in, but you do have to have a system because what one part or, partner earns, the other earns, and what one partner spends, the other spends, because you have to look at this at a household. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, look, no... and look beyond income. I, I, you know. I'd, oh yeah, absolutely. What what uh, my good partner and I end up doing was a we we call it the baton pass. We had periods where I would be earning an income while she built the wealth, and then we actually switched places. Mm. The worker and the wealth builder type type relay. Uh, so, but the focus was on on the end and in destination, not he's making more than me or she's making more than me. It wasn't about income. It was about what we're investing in and where that was going to get us to. Yeah. But we'd had that yeah, conversation. Yeah, and what are we achieving? Yes. 
It's the interdependence so that uh, we need each other, but we're very clear on what our roles are and we're very clear around the rules around how that's going to operate because we've had those those conversations. And, I, and again, I, something that I think that you've, you've done very well is to create Australia's first pre-marriage money course where you're actually uh, creating an environment where you can safely have all those hard conversations yeah. before you get into yeah. assumption land and then suddenly find out that you're in trouble. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that whole... Um, getting aligned and having that discussion. Talk talk about you know talking money with your honey without having the money talk is a huge advantage for a couple. Um, so a couple that is aligned. It doesn't mean you have to agree all the time. No, but you do have to have alignment on um, values. And there's a lot of evidence that says couples who have shared values succeed. Yeah. And succeeding at a marriage or relationship is very positively linked to both happiness and asset accumulation. Yeah, they go hand in hand pretty much. Yep. And the falling apart of a relationship is both – emotionally difficult but it's also financially difficult yeah because you take a lifestyle that's been built on two incomes and you double the fixed costs of maintaining that entity and you're doing that in an environment that's emotionally fraught so nobody's making rash decisions yeah the number of people i've seen who've spent so much money on lawyers to have that argument Totally. That they end up, end up not having. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a story of one client who had a very acrimonious um, divorce and he spent – she moved out of Sydney and so he spent a fortune with lawyers to be able to send their son to his old school. And by the time he got through that and won the case, he didn't have enough money to pay the school fees. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's yeah. So that they're the six decisions. Now, I can help you with the first four. Um, but um, you know the other two are largely around, and that's the how you make a living and who you marry are largely around aligning your passions and your values together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, something that I love, and I've, I've done it, and I just did it for fun. I, I jumped on and did the uh, money personality exercise. Yep. What, what, did you, what did you profile? Uh, You're probably an achiever, are you? No, I keep talking. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Uh, you I, would have, I would have thought you'd be an achiever or a producer. <laughs> yeah, but, more, yeah, yeah, the producer's... But just was it, but but uh, what a, a fun way to actually again get. And I'm, I encourage the listeners to jump on on board and do this to get together. To do it independently and then compare notes yep. because it, the, again the discussion that promotes in terms of what's important to you individually and then collectively uh, will allow you to in, in a in a very uh, unthreatening safe way start to understand each other better and then make better. Uh, relationship and uh, financial decisions. I think it's awesome. Hey, one of the tools that I also lo- like that because uh, I, you know, some great stuff that you've put together here is the is the Pearl tool. Can you talk to us a bit about the Pearl tool? Yeah, um, and this sort of comes back to my point about budgeting is an optimization and um, problem rather than a rationing problem. And so when we come to talk about getting more from your money, um, of course you need a budget, right? Of course you need to review your spending. But if you start with the what can I cut, you're going to end up with something sustainable. So we've developed this tool called the PEARL, um, which stands for P is for postpone, E is for eliminate, A is for avoid, R is for reduced and L is for love. And so the idea is to identify, go through everything you spend and look for items that you can postpone. So um, 
they're things that, um, yeah, so things like deferring replacing your car. So if you keep your car for six years instead of five, are you really going to notice? But it's actually going to save you a ton of money. Yeah. Um, if I move my haircut from four weeks to five weeks, I've just got my haircut, hair budget by 25% without noticing it. Um, now, with my hair, I can't actually do that. The four weeks is about as far as I can go. <laughs> same, same. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm looking like right Chewbacca now. right now because I'm in lockdown here in Victoria and I can't go to the hairdresser. <laughs> so my, my, bar, my barber always maintains that he should charge me more because of the volume. Um, <laughs> then eliminate is looking at the stuff that's just not adding value. Um, and that stuff that, you know, subscriptions are a big one here. Yeah. Yeah. You look just look at the subscriptions you build up over time. Um, yeah. Netflix, Stan, YouTube Premium, Tidal. Um, it starts to mount up. And I'm not suggesting that you avoid them all, but um, you know, which ones are you actually using? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the eliminate. Um, the avoid is around people or circumstances. We all have those friends who make us spend money that we don't necessarily want to. Yeah, the friend that can't go to the pub for one drink. Um, and Or the friend for women that's getting often, you to pay a, that when it gets to their shout, there's always yeah. a reason why they can't do it. <laughs> yeah, and for women often it's, you know, you go shopping with a particular friend who encourages you to buy stuff that you might not otherwise buy and you never return it. That's the avoid. Reduce is about... Um, you know, rather than cutting something out, can I simply buy less of it? Um, you know, my, my doctor, when I went for my company medical many years ago, um, was talking about diet and he said, um, yeah, I know you like to toast for breakfast, but how about a little more butter and a little less jam? All right. So that's about achieving the same goal, but cutting out the empty calories. And then the final one is love, and that is focus on the bits that really add value to your life. Yeah, in the words of Marie Kondo, you know, does it strike joy? And focus on those things. So moving, um, you know, moving spending from a category that isn't adding value to one that you love. Um, Adds a huge amount of value to your life. That's a that's an awesome framework. Yeah, so that's so that's really so we we work through that, and that's um, you know one of the lessons in our budgeting course. Um, we got through that with them, and it's just you can do it frequently. Yeah, and mm. you just dump dump out your bank transactions or your credit card transactions, and get, and just put a P E R A R L next to it, and it just focuses the mind. You go, did I get value? And that's why when we're doing our Budgeting, so we get people to, um, rather than using an app, to actually write down what they spend as they spend it yeah. and know how do I feel at this point? Who am I with and how did I pay? And that intelligence will make budgeting so much easier. Well, and it, that's starting uh, to inculcate yeah. habits again. It's, that's what I yeah. love so, about so, what you're doing so, there. It's, yeah. that's so really am, I, am I buying this coffee because I'm bored at work? In which case I probably should be, or because it's 11.30 and it's just a habit. Well, they're sort of easy ones to break. Yeah. Um, but if I'm buying it because actually I'm stressed and I need something or because everyone from work goes out and grabs one mid-morning and it's a social thing or um, – I mean, I, I have a big habit um, of stopping at a cafe on my way to work. Not that I'm going to work these days, but stopping in a cafe with the newspaper yep. and having a coffee. So the three dollars fifty um, is about the, for the coffee is about the same as the three dollars fifty for the newspaper, um, but it means I arrive at work relaxed and up to speed on what's happened overnight. It, it's that, just a habit that I've had for. And it makes you feel good. You, you said it. Yeah. You know, how does it make me feel? Well, I, I actually feel exactly. like I've uh, started the day well. It's yeah. But like, I know that the third coffee doesn't <laughs> strike joy. Um, so yeah, it's it's about understanding all of those things that matter to you, 
and um, what matters to me doesn't matter to you. Yeah, love it. Yeah, my, my, my partner would never read a newspaper. She's yeah. just not interested. Yeah, yeah. But switching, um, before I switch into the ambush round, I, I want to sort of <laughs> um, jump into uh, the four key things that, uh, listeners should look at before they in, invest. Again, it's a subject that's close to your heart. I'd love you to share that with us. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one. I mean, one of the things that the media and the regulator, ASIC, bangs on about is fees. Yeah. And that the number one thing you should consider, according to these sources, is fees. And Whilst fees are important and they're one of the few things we can control, um, they're actually a relatively part. And I will put them at number four. And the three things that are more important um, and the ones that will make the difference between success and failure is, first of all, asset allocation. Yep. So does this product, and I'm talking investments and super here. So does this product have an asset allocation that is a spread between shares, property, bonds, cash, commodities, gold, whatever, that aligns with my risk profile, time horizon, and ability to recover? So if it doesn't align with all of those things, then doesn't matter what price it is. It's not going to deliver what you want to do. So you've got to get that right first. And it, an asset allocation is the biggest single factor in driving returns. And it's about you know, having the right mix of growth and defensive to give you the returns you want with an ability to sleep at night and keep your finger off the trigger. Um, the second one, and this is the one where most super funds in Australia fall down. And it's probably not just an Australian problem. It's probably an industry problem. And that is transparency. So do I understand what I'm buying? So if I'm buying shares, say, am I buying an index? And if so, what index? who provides it, how it's recalculated, and why it matches my goals. And if it's not an index, how is this guy selecting what it's invested in? And can can I grasp all of that by reading the disclosure document? And I would argue that no ordinary Australian can pick up a Superfund PDS and work all that out. No, no way. It's almost like it's deliberately obscured. That a typical super fund PDS has got about 70 pages of what super is and 20 pages of marketing and 10 pages of what it's invested in, most of which actually isn't understandable. Mm. Yeah. And then the final one, um, or the third one, is structure. So what am I, what is the structure I'm actually buying here? So is it, is it clear that what the investment choice I'm making, is that actually what the manager is going to do? So if I tick the, I want to put 40% in Australian equities box because that aligns with my asset, select, asset allocation. Is the manager actually going to go and buy 40% of Australian equities with the money I've just given them? Mm -hmm. And the answer for the most widely spruced, and I'm not going to name names here, the most widely spruced super fund in Australia, in the media, the answer to that question is no. They do not invest your money in what box you've ticked. They tip it in with everything else. And if their asset allocation doesn't align up with your choices, they sort of notionally divvy it up. That is outlined in a paragraph in the PDS in a way that most people, even in the industry, don't grasp the significance of it. Mm. I've polled 
30 financial planners and ask them to read this page in the PDS and tell me what it means. And nobody gets the risk. That's pretty and scary. The same, it is. And that's why I'm not going to name names because that's, that's just not appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the other half of that structure argument is ownership. And the notion that profit for members is of itself a good thing misses the point that profit for members means risk for members. That profit is just payment for risk. Yeah. And those risks um, relate to running an, a financial a funds management business, not to the pool of assets you actually want to invest in to achieve your retirement goals. Um, so the risk that the manager's new IT project runs over budget, cost, and time, instead of being worn by a, a bunch of bank shareholders, is actually worn by you as a member. Mm. Yep. And you don't have to look too far back to see that in action. Yep. So the regulator finds the fund manager. That happens to Westpac. Westpac shareholders wear that risk. Yeah. If it happens to Host Plus, Host Plus members wear that risk. Yep. So you're actually being fined with your own money. Yeah. Um, now, that made sense when um, the market wasn't particularly competitive and it wasn't uncommon to see 2% plus fees. So if you were going from a 2% fee to a 0.5% fee, maybe that's a risk is worth taking. Because these risks are relatively small, yeah. But um, with the compression of fees, um, it is certainly possible, especially at small balances, yeah, to get significantly lower fees without taking that risk. Yes, yeah, and just to show how important this risk is, and I would be surprised if any. Vanguard ETF investors actually read this document um, that Vanguard is owned by the US funds. Yeah. So all of the Vanguard US domiciled domestic funds, and in an Australian context, that means VTS, the US total fund market, yeah. um, invest in Vanguard, the manager. It's a small fraction of, you know, less than 1% of their assets. But when they put that structure together, they actually thought about this problem and said, we will cap your obligation to fix these problems at 0.4% of your investments. So they've recognized that this is potentially a problem. Mm -hmm. And now that, you know, when Vanguard were cheaper than everyone else, when they were pioneering this sort of stuff, that was a risk that you take all day. But, you know, the difference between BlackRock, BetaShares and Vanguard is, you know, one or two basis points. That's 0.01%. Um, I don't think that's a risk I'd take for mm. 0.01%. I certainly would have taken it for 0.4%. Yeah. Because it obviously wasn't going to happen every year. Yeah. So they're the three. And then finally we come to price. Um, and... That all gets lost in this noise. Um, and, um, you know, we're starting to see funds like these 0% fees, which are created by either derivatives or by investing in cash. Yeah. So it's not that they don't cost any money. It's just that the costs don't have to be disclosed. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't stop them having to having an impact on your net returns. Yeah, of course. So you you don't always get what you pay for, though, and that's why advice is critical in this. Totally, totally. And, and, um, nobody who hasn't spent a lifetime doing this should be expected 
to read these documents. And um, one of my favourite quotes, um, Sir, Sir Anthony Mason, I think he was a high court judge. I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to legal judgments, but this is one of my favourite ones. Sir Anthony Mason said that the most effective form of concealment is full and detailed disclosure. <laughs> and that's where we've ended up in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And given that compulsory super and the loss of traditional defined benefit pension schemes has turned every Australian, all 18 million adults in the country, into mini fund managers because we're expected to provide for making investment decisions to provide for our retirement that we won't know the impact of for 40 years. Mm, that's so true. And we're all hopelessly unqualified yep. to make that call yep. and the documentation we're provided with makes it harder. Yeah, it's a, and that's why I am so obsessed about delivering accessible, affordable, understandable advice to all Australians. Yeah, love it. Love what you're doing there. I'm just going to going to pivot a little bit here. Uh, given the times that we're in and what we're coming out of and the, the massive wake-up mm-hmm. call that many of us have had as a result of the the contagion, uh, you know, there's in every in every challenge is opportunity. Uh, if you were a mid thirties, mid forties couple with a home and a home loan and a couple of hundred grand in super and and some money mm-hmm. sitting in an offset account, uh, generically, and this is not financial advice. What what do you think <laughs> they need to be thinking about with their with their money now? Yeah, um, and this, this is you know I, I, I talked to Glenn James who runs the My Millennial Money podcast a few weeks ago, and he said there's only six questions in financial plan, financial blogging or podcasting. And this is one of them. Um, but the answer for everyone is different. So the the question here is there's, there's sort of three things you can do with surplus cash. You can stick it in super. You can invest it. Or you can pay off your home loan. And I would put putting in an offset in the same category as paying off your home loan because yeah. there's the only difference is tax structure. Yeah. Um, and mathematically, over your life, sticking in super is going to give you the best mathematical answer because you get a tax deduction for putting it in, you pay less tax while it's growing, and you get it out tax-free when you retire. Yeah. The downside of that, though, is you give up flexibility, you take on some regulatory risk, and you lose the ability to access it before retirement. The next thing you can do, but it, the next thing you can do is you could invest it, and again, mathematically, that will give you a better answer than paying off your home loan. Even when home loan rates were, you know, fifteen plus, if you go back over any ten-year period in history, you will find that the return on investing after fees, after tax, is higher than paying off your home loan. But to do that, you are giving up some flexibility and you're giving up um, access to the cash. So for most people, I would start with the how big is your home loan discussion. And if you owe a very large percentage of the value of your property, certainly 80% plus, or your home loan payments are a large proportion of your income, like 30 or more, yep. you should focus, first of all, on repaying your home loan, despite the fact that it will give you a lower overall return. And that's because it's gaining you flexibility. It's gaining you a buffer against the unexpected. And it's um, giving you peace of mind. Yeah. Yep. So, and then, just to clarify, then I'd start. Yeah, the, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, just to clarify, there we're, we're looking at repaying it down to a, a comfortable level, uh, rather yeah. than paying it now off. Now, what's a comfortable level varies from. In, oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I look at debts in three categories. I don't buy this bad debt, good debt argument. Yeah. Um, I think there are three types of this. There is what we call red debts or danger debts, 
and they are debts that arise because you're spending more than you're earning, which broadly means personal loans and credit cards yep. and loans from family. And they are to be got rid of as a priority. That's not to say they're inherently evil, but they should be your number one priority when you have spare cash. Then we come on to amber debts, which are, yeah, okay. And they are largely around spreading the cost of a an asset over the period you're going to use it. And that's usually where you live and what you drive. Yeah. And there is not a huge amount of incentive to focus to the exclusion of everything else on getting rid of those two. Yeah. In fact, I've, I've, I've written an article about why paying cash for your card could be a, a money mistake. And there are a lot of circumstances where pa paying cash for your card will actually cost you more than borrowing the money for it. Yep. Now, that's not an excuse to go and buy an expensive car um, or to take out a 20% car loan. But um, the benefit having the depreciation turn up in your cash flow is a huge mind focuser on why you should buy less car. Yeah. And that will save you money. Yeah. And also, yeah, if you pay cash for your car and then you your deposit on your home is smaller and you have to pay lenders mortgage insurance, well, actually, that's false economy. Exactly. And then we move on to the green debts, which is really income producing and hex. So they are debts incurred to grow your asset base and they obviously come last. Yeah, yeah, love it. That's, that's a very good, again, it's a fantastic framework to start thinking about uh, debt in that context uh, and, and linking it back to what we're talking about in relation to the, the three things that you need to be doing with surplus cash. But I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you back because uh, we've only just scratched the surface on, and there's a lot of other very <laughs> juicy subjects that I would love to uh, drill into. I could talk about this stuff all day. Uh, and, I, and I love it too. I'm right with you there. And rather than try and shoehorn it, uh, let's make sure that we get you back on regularly to, to mm -hmm. drill into some of these uh, topics in a lot of detail so that the mm -hmm. sure. uh, listeners are much better informed. But I'll, I'm going to switch into the, into the ambush series, which are just the quick five questions that the listeners always want to gain your words of wisdom on. You've shared a couple of good quotes with us already, but uh, what's your favourite quote and why? I think I, th I think I might have sh shot that piece of ammunition, <laughs> but um, but I do I do like that whole mindfulness concept that, um, and probably the one that I use most often is that if some is good, more isn't necessarily better. And, you know, so, and that, the point we've just discussed about paying off your debt, you know, paying down your home loan is good, but not if it comes at the expense of something else. Yeah. Um, and that Sir Anthony Mason quote is just gold. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to legal judgments. I love it. No, it's, it is an absolute beauty. It's sort of cloak, cloaking uh, uh, <laughs> impropriety in, in clothes of um, legitimacy. It's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Let's turn to the, the, the reading side of the equation because you're clearly a very avid reader. Uh, what would be the top yes. book you'd recommend uh, or, um, or a couple if you want to throw them in that, yeah. that the listeners well, the, should the have the a look book at? I, the book I reckon that every 20-something should read is a book called The Defining Decade by Meg Jay. Now, Meg Jay is a psychologist in the US. She's a clinical psychologist and her practice is dealing mostly with young people. And this book is about why your 20s matter and her and is told, you know, I think about six case studies where she talks about six of her clients yep. and specific problems that they've had arising out of how they've dealt with their 20s. And it's not just about money. There is a money case study in it. Um, there's about uh, career and work. There's one about um, relationships. There's one about parental relationships. There's about six case studies. It's not. It's a relatively easy read. 
Um, but I reckon that every 20-something should read this. This is why your 20s matter. And um, it's about, you know, if 30 is the new 20, we can't really expect it to also be the new 65. So what are you doing in your 20s to set yourself up for life? And that's, you know, who you who you make friends with, where you live, how you decide to to work, and it's not to say that gap year you shouldn't have a gap year, although that's going to be pretty hard for this year's graduates. But it's not yeah. about saying you know don't go be a ski instructor in Aspen. It's about being conscious of what you're doing and how it sets you up for the rest of your life. Yeah. And yeah. your 20s do actually matter. It's not this downtime between university and adulthood. Um, what happens there does matter. It's a very foundational decade, actually, uh, given that it's not, it's not it, I mean, it's, it's got huge money implications, but the book itself is not about money. Mm. But I, I get every 20-something I talk to to read this book. Yeah, love it. Switching back to the uh, Australians love to talk about tax and how much they pay. What's what's the top legal thing that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay? I mean, I think you've got to go a long way these days to go beyond super. I mean, that is the last legal tax haven um, and there's a huge amount of opportunity, particularly for small business people. Yeah. And, um, you know, sort of anyone who's growing a business – before they hit the $2 million in revenue, they really ought to think of some of these strategies. Yeah. Um, and now that I've ju- just about to turn 58, uh, I'm a few, couple of months away from it, um, and I've achieved my condition of release, um, it's just a – well, that's not a license to print money, but it is the best legal tax haven. Yeah. But, you know, if you're – in your 20s or 30s, um, I think you probably have to give up too much to get that. Yeah, understood. Yeah. And so it's about doing it at the right time and not leaving it too late. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing sadder as a financial planner than to have a 55-year-old walk into your office and go, I want to retire, and they've got no money. Yeah. The oh, sh- oh shit! Yeah, moment. Time do- time fixes most problems, but at fifty five, you ain't got much of it left. No, it's spot on, absolutely dead right. And unfortunately, I I get to see quite a few though though as well. It's a bushy, get me into property. I, I need to retire in five years, <laughs> and I've got no super. And it's like mm, ain't going to happen. That's a disaster. That's that's a disaster waiting to happen. Absolutely, and it it is more common than not. Unfortunately, uh, swinging back into the investment arena for a minute, what's both the yeah. worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received? Vince? Well, I think the best piece has got to be this point around diversification. And it's one I didn't really understand when I was given it, that diversification really is the only free run, free lunch when it comes to investing. Yeah, It saved my ass in 1987. Yeah. And I didn't really understand why I was doing what I was doing. I was following this advice, but it was only – after the event, did I realise why that is sound advice? Yeah. And diversification is not about number of investments. It's about having different ones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, love that. Um, so that's certainly the the best piece of advice. Um, the worst piece, although it turned out to be outrageously successful, was the advice I gave myself to buy these Macquarie Bank shares in 1995. <laughs> I would advise any client not to do what I did Um, and it was a dumb decision at the time that had an outstanding outcome (laughs) but it was in the context of my finances at the time as you know newly married buying a house which I was about to renovate um it was a outrageously risky act, action. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, no, nobody says that in hindsight. So, you know, the guy who 
you know, bought Bitcoin at a dollar and rolled it to whatever, 18,000 or 21,000, wherever it went to, um, doesn't talk about the risk they took at a dollar. They talk about the success they had at $21,000. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I acknowledge, I didn't at the time, I thought, I know what I'm doing. I work for this bank. I can. I, I know this is a great investment. And yes, it probably was, but that was no excuse to put that proportion of my wealth into it when I was embarking on some pretty big spending exercises. Mm, mm. Yeah, good context. So, bringing it down to the uh, sort of daily habitual level, what's a personal habit or ritual that you believe contributes most to your investment success? Um, well, I think in terms of personal qualities, um, patience, tenacity and tolerance are um, you know, critical to success with money and probably life in general. So the ability, and I think Warren Buffett, I, I don't normally like quoting Warren Buffett, but I think he said something about the stock market being a, a machine that transfers wealth from the impatient to the patient. Yeah. And I think that's right. So tenacity um, and tolerance, so stick at it, but understanding the difference between tenacity and stubbornness, which is where a lot of people fall down um and i must admit i am a creature of habit i mean there are things that i do um you know i go to a i go to a cafe in one every friday i've gone to this cafe same cafe for almost 10 years um to have breakfast and read the paper on a friday morning um i stop on my way to work um there are just i have pizza with my son every friday night um there are just things that that these habits form fixed points in our lives that um, help put the rest of the stuff in context. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's part of the joy part that you mentioned earlier. Mate, uh, exactly. Uh, sort of jumping into the, the final question today, uh, if I gave you a microphone that spoke to every single one of the 7.7 billion people that are currently alive in the world and I gave you one minute to talk, what would you say? Um, I, I will still come back to this point about the six important decisions that success with money is not about thousands of small decisions made well. It's about getting this handful right. So put your big rocks in the jar first and then you can fill the sand into the gaps. And that feeds everything that you do with money. When it, you know, When it comes to budgeting, you know, understand that all spending fulfills some need and that a budget is about aligning your spending with what matters, that it's not about deprivation, it's not about cutting back, it's about making sure that you've identified the needs. And it's important that Maslow never talked about his hierarchy of needs and wants. He talked about his hierarchy of needs. Mm. Some of those needs are more immediate, like the need for food, shelter, and warmth. Um, But they all matter, and most spending fulfills one at the same time. Mm. And that you need to understand what needs matter to you right now. And the whole need for purpose and fulfilment and aesthetic pleasure are grossly underrated. And, um, yeah, they may be less immediate than food, shelter and warmth, but really we're not living a subsistence farming existence anymore. We all have more than necessary to fulfil those needs. And so getting to this point around purpose and fulfilment is um, central. Yeah, 
totally. to living a living a full, fulfilled life. It's the magnet and the compass, as I often say, the magnet and the compass. Uh, love that. So it's not, it's not necessarily life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but life, liberty, and the pursuit of fulfilment. <laughs> Dead right, mate. Uh, been very enjoyable. I, I feel like I could uh, talk with you for hours, and uh, and we will do that progressively over time now. Uh, for those that uh, you've really picked up their interest and want to uh, know more and do more with Life Sherpa, how can they do that? Well, we're at uh, lifesherpa.com.au. That's our website. Um, on Facebook, we're at My Life Sherpa, and on and at Instagram on My Life Sherpa. Um, but you know, go to the website, um, and there's lots of articles to read there, which will give you greater detail. And and of course, the book, The Latte Fallacy, is on the website. Yeah, brilliant. And in what? fact, until until September 30, which I'm not sure whether this is going to go out after September 30 or not. But we have our uh, budget course for free as a COVID response until September 30. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, it's a great offering. We might be, they might have a day to do it, I reckon. Uh, <laughs> this will go live virtually yeah, very close to the end of the month. Uh, mate, it's been very enjoyable. I will encourage the listeners to jump on your website and grab a copy of the book. You have this uh, great ability to uh, communicate in a way that's both entertaining and engaging and breaking down what can be quite some confusing and complex subjects into a language that's very easy to understand and and get your head around. So it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Looking forward to staying in touch with you, Vince, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Great. It's been an absolute joy. What a blast. Thanks, mate. Thank you, Bushy. Bye. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. It's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if die.